Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, Eldon here speaking with us to get on his, on his huge list of universities and places that, that he's been touring around, giving uh, one of, or two of eight uh, specialized talks that he has as part of a distinguished lecture tour uh, through GSA and also through um, the uh, um, AEG, Association for Engineering Geology. So um, Eldon comes from a huge uh, background, lots of experience uh, internationally. He's the president of, uh, of Earth Consultants International, which is a consulting firm that solves complex geologic problems all over, all over the world. Um, and and uh, just next week, he's off to India to, 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 to speak. Uh, not, and <laughs> Doesn't sound like and not be paid. And not be paid for it. But, um, so, uh, um, as, uh, although um, Eldon did get his, his uh, BS at the University of Minnesota, he spent most of his time after that in California, um, trying to get post postgraduate degrees at uh, Cal State LA, UC Irvine, and uh, uh, um, UC Riverside. Uh, but because he was so busy, he never actually finished. But that's okay. We don't want to miss him, and because he's uh, uh, he's been incredibly accomplished and and, um, and, and has and has uh, been involved in, in hundreds of different projects. So. We're very lucky to have him here, and um, as part of the as part of the Richard H. Johns Distinguished Lecture in Applied Geology, uh, here's Eldon Gaff. Thank you. Thank you. How many of these do you show? All of them. Just the back one. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is sort of the last week of my magical mystery tour here, but it, then it continues in India, and it continues in, in Baltimore, and then it turns out I've been invited to some other places after I'm done. But nevertheless, the kind will continue. So Dick Johns, is, I've just got a little background on Dick Johns. His, he's a very important person in the practical field of engineering geology, um, and for many reasons. Number one, he's very strong academic reputation. Um, PhD, of course, Caltech uh, professor at Caltech for many, many years, uh, department chair at Penn State, and ultimately dean of applied sciences at, at Stanford. And, and so with those kind of credentials, you'd think he's kind of just, you know, an egghead. But the, the reality is, is that he, he has great field, field sense, and these are the days when, you know, steel-toed boots were like, huh? So, I first learned about Dick Johns when I was researching to put together a field trip in San Diego, and it turns out we we're going to go to these pegmatite mines, and that's what he did his dissertation on, was pegmatite mineralogy. From that, he got involved in consulting projects and research projects for mining companies, which led him to appreciate slope stability, and ultimately the earthquake-related issues with respect to slope stability, and in California, these are both pretty, pretty big topics to get involved in. And so, but he never lost his interest in, in the mineral resources area and the mineralogy and petrology. Um, so I won't badmouth it anymore. But anyway, so because, you know, he still kept that broadness. And I really encourage you so much to never lose that broadness. Keep what you know and keep learning that. Geology is so encompassing that it is, is just sad to see people get really focus down a very narrow path very early in their careers. Do that when you're 90, you know? But keep your broadness, keep your interest. Everything is cool out there. And to prove that, it's out there. And Dick Johns was very famous for the quality and the intensity of his field trips. Um, I guess back then you, you could do that too, huh? But I guess in, in Texas now you can again. Um, so, he also didn't just test names and words and concepts. He tested applying those. He was very famous for the, the, the difficulty, if you will, of his, of his exams. So much so that AEG actually published like 100 pages of them in our journal just so that other people could potentially use those as well. And a lot of them ended up on the professional licensure exam because those are the kind of problems that make you think, not just remember. And, and he realized early on in his career that for geology to be a profession, it should be licensed as one. That gave you the same degree of professional credibility as the engineers. 
So he fought long and hard to get licensure incorporated into California. Now, thanks to ADG and a couple other groups, it's spread almost across the entire United States. The next place he really focused on that actually gave many of us jobs was getting geology built into the building code. These, these are buildings built on our planet, and there was not a single word in the original building code having to do with what the ground was about in the geological sense. Soil strengths, yes, but what about landslides? What about subsidence? What about other things that were in there? So he was instrumental in getting Los Angeles to first get geology as a requirement on all building projects, and that led to its incorporation into the International Building Code, and an entire profession was essentially born. He also really stressed professional involvement. It is amazing how many people I have given talks to over this year who have come up to me afterwards and said, you know, I was a John student, you know, and that's why I'm here, because we never forget, we never stop going to meetings, we never stop being involved. So he has just, if you're going to be a professional, get involved in the profession. If you want a job, go to McDonald's. But get, if you're going to be a professional, get involved in the profession. That is what has been made my career as far as I'm concerned. So you can tell how famous the guy was and how well respected. Just about every geological organization and, and engineering organization wrote an obituary um, about him. AEGs is 105 pages long. Okay, so the John's Lectureship is named after him because of the ability to get out and communicate to students about picking engineering or environmental geology as a career choice. It, I call it applied geology. I understand that if you're looking for minerals or you're looking for oil, you're applying geology concepts in those pursuit. But the one I practice in is the only one that has a direct and almost instantaneous um, impact on public health, safety, and welfare. You're working for the public and it's a very important responsibility that you need to wear the hat rather, rather carefully. So, uh, so I'm trying to promote this. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the lectureship. Also, maybe you know, you'll learn a few things. I don't know. My other big focus is I think it's important to have fun because if you're not having fun in your job, well, then you're probably working at McDonald's. So. A little bit about me, we heard too much already, so I'm going to go through this fast. I formed, uh, I was president of AEG in 1996-97, formed Earth Consultants International in 1996-97. That's a bad plan. I don't encourage anyone else to do that. Um, but you deal the cards you're, you're left with. And the point was is that we put international in the name of the company because, frankly, after 20 years, I was bored with California. Um, I'm bored with the politics, bored with the regulations, bored with the narrowness of all of the geology issues. Despite it being sort of the mecca for engineering <laughs> geology, we wanted to see the world and I was hoping people would pay me to see it. And some of them have. So in this case, I've been very fortunate that I've actually worked on some extensive field projects in half a dozen countries. We've done work in 21 different countries so far in our 18 years. So it's been quite quite a fun deal, and I encourage you to just don't get localized in your provinciality too quickly either. Also, don't lose the scientific method. Every single thing that you do as a professional from here on out is going to be just a research project. Every hole you drill is testing a theory. It is not just collecting data. It is testing and validating or refuting a theory that you have already developed about something. Multiple working hypothesis, the scientific method, everything you're trying to teach you here works in real life too. That's why it's important to learn it. And, and it's possible still even to jump I mean, I have a bachelor's degree from a school that doesn't have earthquakes or landslides anywhere in the curriculum, and yet I've managed to score a half a dozen pretty nice research grants and another half a dozen um, outreach kind of grants because I guess I talk a lot. So that is my other thing. Get out there and tell people about what you're doing. It isn't that hard. I mean, GSA, a 12 minute talk, you can do that in your sleep. You only need five slides and you're done and the time, the light comes on, say thank you. And write some papers, field trip guidebooks, learn to write. It is still a written world out there. Every project we do requires a written report, so sorry you don't escape that just by graduating. So I've got a few papers out there. 
Two of them have won awards from AEG and GSA for outstanding paper awards. And the secret to that is find great co-authors. Nothing gets done individually anymore. Papers don't, research doesn't, projects don't. You're going to be working in a team the rest of your life. Get good co-authors, or even better, find a great first author and then make the paper better because you can help, you can work with them on that. So find a good team as well, is what I'm saying. I've always been a team sports fan from baseball, volleyball. It's always nice to drink wine with friends as opposed to sitting home by yourself. So find a great team. If it isn't the team for you, quit. Find another one. Your first job is very unlikely to be your last job. And then, of course, great team. Have, I have a great wife, and that's what's made all of this possible. She even busted me in one of these, because it still said 33 years, and apparently we had an anniversary the day before. <laughs> you know, that stuff happens. Um, so, this is a case study. This is one of the projects that my company did for um, uh, a public hazard study, and hazard mapping, and working with communities on disaster mitigation in advance. So it's, it's like hazard mitigation and disaster um, response planning and things like that. And this is a very important topic uh, for me because this is about 30% of the work that we do in our company, is working for cities, preparing hazard maps, and helping them understand the vulnerability that they have now in their community. So as a geologist, this is pretty good work, because what else are you doing but making geologic hazard maps? I mean, this is you know, rubber meets the road kind of stuff. So hopefully you'll appreciate it. Because truly, I don't think God has anything to do with it. Um, it is all acts of man. This is disaster by design. It was designed by someone to put these houses in the middle of this can mouth of this canyon. It was designed by someone upstream to build a very small little detention basin that was about one third the size it should be. And this is the result. These are all acts of people. And this is the cycle. I invented this a long time ago, and I've, I think it, it still works. But everywhere there's a ha hazards are everywhere. I mean, crossing the street is a hazard. But geologic hazards are basically what we're focusing on here. And it's like, if the tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, is there, it doesn't make a sound. Well, hazards are really not hazards, per se, unless there's somebody exposed to those hazards. And when that happens, then there's a vulnerability that's attached to it, and that's called risk. What is the probability that this will happen? What would be the consequences for this to happen? And when it happens, of course, which it seemingly always does, that leads to a loss. And, and that, of course, brings out the lawyers. And in Dess's California story, mind you, but nevertheless, there is a response to that loss. It may be litigation, it may be something else, but it leads to an investigation. Who could have known this? What, do, what can we do differently? And out of that is assigned responsibility or liability, and in there then lies new regulations that try to make this not happen again. And that is what we generally call mitigation. But then, as that, this, it's a, what I show here is it's truly a cycle because this arrow has a, has a numerical value in it. When we say mitigation, we're designing for a flood of this height instead of one of this height, for example. So there's thresholds upon which we have to set limits, such as the seven meter high tsunami wall in front of Tohoku, Japan, for example, instead of a 20 meter high tsunami wall. Different things like that, and that's where geology comes in because we help design those thresholds based on prior experiences. So this is, a, as I said, this is a case study. It's Riverside County, Southern California, one of the largest counties in the state, um, and they were doing a comprehensive countywide plan driven by this whole, by the environmental um, issues about uh, species and, and the ha um, um, extinction issues and, and a huge new concept plan on transportation. And in California, we have a general plan and it contains all of these things in it. And I'm just gonna focus on the hazard map component of it. It was a 
huge, lots of people working on it. We were uh, at the tip of the spear, actually, because our hazard maps basically became the foundation upon which all these other plans were developed. So here's Riverside County, um, 35,000 square kilometers. It's quite big. Most everybody lives here, however. And so for most of the examples I'm going to give you, because it doesn't project well, we're just going to focus in on the place where the 3 million people live. They had huge growth plans, tripling in the next 20 years, because this was where all the cheap houses were. Let's all move from Orange County. Let's all move out there and buy a house. Obviously, the economy tripped that up, and it has probably gone to about 5 million, but um, not quite where they thought they would be. So in a general plan, and this is just state government, there's these elements, these different elements, circulation, land use, housing, these are all factored in. And all we're going to talk about today is the safety component, which is the geohazard aspect of it. But this is the legal framework upon which communities, counties, and cities can regulate development within their boundaries. It's sort of the constitution, if you will, of their, their um, regulatory authority. And it's all held in, within codes in California. We've got codes for everything. Um, we've got building codes for how to build. We've got fire codes for how to prevent. And it's all legal under the uh, California and the US Environmental Quality Act. And the, what makes it legal is the point of its protection of public health, safety, and welfare. It doesn't say anything about protection of property rights. It has to do with public health, safety, and welfare. Because this is sort of a poster child for the 1971 earthquake rupturing about a three-quarter meter high rupture right through this subdivision in San Fernando. No one was killed, but it led to the new requirement that earthquakes, for the first time, earthquakes be built into the safety element of the general plan. 1971 it took that. Otherwise it was just flooding and, and uh, fires and, and uh, slopes, uh, soil instability it was called. So now we've got hazards, you know, they're everywhere. I mean, but there's a big difference in your language between a hazard and a danger. A hazard is your neighbor says, wow, look at that tree, that's really leaning over your house. Well, that's a hazard. Your neighbor comes over and says, you see those roots pulling out of the ground? Now it's starting to become a danger. And tomorrow, we got 80 mile an hour winds planned. Now it's truly a danger. So realize, recognize the difference between those because geologists really shouldn't be using danger very often. You need to be really careful about that. Really, truly, we are hazard identifiers. Danger lies in a whole different place. Sometimes you do have to use that word, but it's, the point is, is that hazards can be recognized and mitigated, and that's the point of what our entire job is, truly. So the natural hazards we're gonna focus on are just the big, you know, the big five, if you will. Um, Earthquakes, floods, landslides, erosion, and wildfire. Erosion is sort of just a catch-all for soils and things like that. But Riverside County was not the most, um, uh, well, they were sort of playing, playing with disasters, but the majority of their disasters were fire and floods, the two, the two uh, members of the apocalypse out there. And, and they hadn't really had many earthquakes that had done much damage, despite having some pretty impressive faults running through the county. But this was a new era, and they're gonna call it a journey, and they're gonna call it, use a lot of those nice words, but it all has to do with the public safety providing the foundation upon land use, upon transportation, upon species conservation, because perhaps if you've got an area that is completely impacted with landslides, that might be very good mountain lion habitat too, you know? So those maps that we have to prepare become the basis for everything. So it's nice to be accurate as well. So they wanted to introduce safety into every aspect of community planning. This was the first thing. So when you pulled up a property that you wanted to do something with or you wanted to buy, Everything came up on there that said, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, and you have to satisfy all these issues. And the first thing that popped up was the geohazards aspects that you needed to identify and mitigate those hazards um, in any new development process. And then they wanted to go back and look at all of the things that had already been built and deal with the hazards already in place 
and what can we do as a community to mitigate those over time? Strengthen the disaster planning, work on post let's not rebuild the same stupid thing in the same wrong place, that kind of thing. So let's get into it. So the mapping methodology, I mean, this is, um, you know, obviously a GIS world, and it's all driven by that, but then within the policies were, were some really golden opportunities to make a difference. So we, we developed these, this series of hazard maps. Many of them, you know, stack up on top of each other, uh, typical multi-layers, and because different data sets are used for different things. So, so these are the primary hazard maps that we, we generated. Many problems with these data, okay? We're talking, you know, 12 years ago now, data sets were sort of uh, all over the place. Totally wrong projection, uh, no projection data came with the, with the metadata sets, for example. Can't verify the sources. I mean, this is a big problem that you really need to be careful with because there's lots of data out there floating in the, in the internet, but if you can't verify who did it, what their accuracy was, what the basis for that data was for, what the scale was originally, and the problem is you can blow scales up to, to way past what they're appropriate for at the time they were made. Hundreds of different geologic unit names were in existence, and many of them referring to the same unit, but of different names and different eras. And then lines don't match up, of course, from quad to quad. There's differing interpretations, and how do you resolve those? Be careful that if there is no data, that doesn't mean there is no hazard. There is just no data. So be careful how you, you phrase those kind of, of concepts when you finish. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of geotechnical investigation reports for development projects. And the problem is, is that they're just unverifiable. And they can't be used because they're just not in a, in a, in a format that can be easily integrated into the system. And then just be careful about enlarging things past what they were originally mapped at. So here's one of the examples. This is one of the foundational data sets. You start with the DEM. Well, it's a huge county, so we went with a 30-meter DEM. It became the, the, the basis for calculating a lot of things, um, principally used for liquefaction. You need to know depth of water. You need to know slope stability, so you need slope <coughs> gradients. Flooding, of course, you need to pick out the, um, the uh, channels and things, and, and the upstream area. And then fire, of course, is, uh, you know, burns uphill faster than it burns downhill, and there's different different topographic factors that fit into fire modeling, which was something we didn't know much about, but it became kind of fun to learn. A lot of errors in this as well, but you push through those things. So, as I said, there's hundreds of geologic maps for this area. Quadrangles, um, 24,000, 500,000, different dust. We condense all these hundreds of different units down to 11. Because the only thing that mattered was, how did they behave? That is the most important aspect for how that is. So we picked two Holocene units, fine grain and coarse grain, because they behave differently, and they have different settlement properties. Two Pleistocene, same thing. Tertiary, sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic, and landslide. Landslides behave, they're their own creatures, so we left them as a separate data um, layer. And so here's what that map looks like. It has absolutely no, no value in and of itself. This becomes the map that you use to do a lot of the another analysis with, just like that DEM does. But it's kind of hideously pretty in a way. Um, and this becomes the basis of your data, essentially, for liquefaction, which has to do with how the ground will shake in an earthquake, um, the slope stability issues. So you use the DEM and the different geologic units here, and then subsidence, erosion, things like that. So this is just one of the basic tools in there. Another basic set of data was there's 47,000 earthquakes recorded in Riverside County. So for a place that actually hasn't had much of a de uh, an earthquake history, they sure have a lot of small, small earthquakes. And, uh, but they're scattered everywhere. Now some of this might be because the catalog is not very good and this is all, of course, a moving target in how that gets processed. But we sorted it by depth and location. We, it made a nice communication tool 
but it wasn't really useful in terms of defining the hazard much better than just, you have earthquakes. Here's where the fault ruptures are, the active faults through the system though. In California, we have the Alcos Perillo Act based on that rupture through the, through the um, San Fernando subdivision. So here we have, to, we have mapped, this is the Elsinore Fault Zone right in here. Here is the San Jacinto Fault. Here's the San Andreas coming in, and it continues off down here, of course. And then there's many other faults in here. So we went with the active, which are the ones that are clearly a Holocene displacement, which is the active definition in the Alcos Priolo Act, potentially active, where it clearly affects quaternary sediments, but we just don't have good data on whether it affects Holocene or not, or whether it has gone has been inactive for 11,000 years. And then probably inactive, for which there really doesn't seem to be any convincing reason to, to think it's active, but nobody has actually looked. And if you're going to put a hospital right on top of it, maybe it would be appropriate to look. So these three things, depending on what your project is, so the Alcos Perello is one size fits all. Here, you prioritize based on the investigation requirements based on the type of project that's being proposed. So critical facilities require a more robust geologic study at greater distances even from your project. So here's the typical Alquist Priolo zone. <coughs> and anywhere within here, geologic studies are required for any, any um, project, technically only for residential, but it's applied much more broadly than that. So, but we opened it up for others, for, so for a, like a critical facility, if you're within half a mile of a quaternary fault, look for what's underneath your building. Just do a study, There's, they're not that big a deal, these are multi, hundreds of millions of dollars of projects, and hundreds of people's lives are involved in them. Same thing for increase, so increase the hazard criteria also for high occupancy buildings, these 20, 30 story tower buildings that are starting to become much more common. These thousand unit condominiums, for example. Little ratchet up the scale of the investigation to understand this. Recognize that the, the, the law of the unintended consequences is if you can't build a house on the fault in, under the Aquas Perello, you move the street and put the street down the fault. So here's the gas line that ruptured in the Northridge earthquake, burnt down. 12 homes all the way around it. So do you think they fared any better? Um, be aware that lifelines are a big hazard and they need to resist fault rupture as well as, as houses. And then, as new data comes in, and there's hundreds of trenches being dug every month across faults in California, nobody really uses that data to upgrade the hazard maps. So why not? Why not? Let's do that. Let's make that a requirement. In fact, let's do that for every boring that's drilled. This map set that we're giving you to this county, update it with all the new data that's coming in. And be careful about those unintended consequences. So the other hazard, the one that causes actually probably more damage, um, uh, Loma Prieta earthquake and, and um, surely the Christchurch earthquake, um, is liquefaction related things and landslide areas the slope stability stuff. The, after the, the Loma Prieta earthquake, the state passed the law, the, the um, Seismic Hazard Mapping Act, that to mandatorily require geologic investigations in landslide zones and liquefaction zones to get rid of this, uh, oh, we didn't know, it. we didn't see it coming kind of thing. So there's mandatory investigations and much more intensive geotechnical analysis than, than used to be the case. So. We did that in, in Riverside County, but we expanded it because there's other issues involved here. This is the, the uh, landslide and, and slope instability map. Hundreds and hundreds of landslides, but in some cases, these are just the tip of the iceberg in here. This whole red zone, for example, is just a series of landslides waiting to happen. Right in the, it's the badlands. There's lots of large landslides. Um, and we based it on the, that, those geological parameters for the fine grain deposits or bedded fine grain deposits and not based it on slope, on seismic sources because quite literally they're everywhere. So it just requires varying levels of geological and geotechnical. In other words, let us do our job. These maps allow us to do our job. They require us to do our job, but you know, that's the same thing. So. 
And so again, the policies enhance the, the geologic awareness of this problem and enhance the quality and intensity of the geologic investigations. So don't build a house right on the edge of Pacific uh, Highway, for example. Require deformation or not. This slope was, mod was actually modeled uh, before this house was up there, and, and this area right about here was identified as the highest risk. So they put down a couple of caissons and said, well, that'll do it. But it didn't. Here's some of their caissons still falling out. So require and, and, and just basically get, get a more awareness of the, of the problem of failure and get the geology and the engineering engaged at a higher, higher level. Groundwater was another one of the data maps. There's 12,000 water wells in Riverside County, all of which had records that go back, some of them 100 years, some of them only a few years, some of them have 50 year gaps in them. And so there's a lot of problems with this groundwater data, but we needed it for the liquefaction and the subsidence maps. So in the process of doing this, we basically built an entire groundwater model for the, the, the county and using depth and then the sediment types that those that water is contained within because you need that for liquefaction. We didn't include the seismic sources, we just made an assumption that it would be strong enough. And then we had susceptibility zones, but we also put in the sediment is susceptible, but we have no data whatsoever on where the groundwater is here. So that changed the way that was mapped. And then within those zones, you, re you regulate the development by requiring better geological and geotechnical analysis. So we just basically, this is pretty standard liquefaction stuff. The Holocene sediments are more highly susceptible to liquefaction than the Pleistocene. Um, any bedrock units are generally not susceptible, but based on their sediment type and the density, you end up with a um, high, medium, and low susceptibility to, um, to um, liquefaction. And the deeper the water table is, again, the lower the sensitivity to that. But we had, so that's these, but we have these areas here in the greens and some of the yellows where we had no groundwater depth at all. So we still put them in, the sediments are susceptible, but somebody has to go in and prove where the water is. And so if you're the first developer to hit this pot, this, this puddle, then you need to prove that one way or the other. And then we'll revise the maps accordingly. So again, as I, it's the same old story, but just allow people to do their jobs. And the only way you allow it in this world is to require it. And so within Riverside County, these are investigation requirements. But again, now they're scaled to the intensity and the critical nature of the project. And then be aware that a lot of these zones are preliminary, so adjust the, the colors as data becomes available, because that's what a GIS system really allows you to do. It doesn't have to be fixed on a mylar sheet and printed at 10,000 copies at, at a time. Subsidence is fairly, uh, well, it's kind of unique to, to Riverside County. For the Southern California counties, it's not so unique to California. Obviously, the whole San Joaquin Valley is going through that right now. but. Um, they have huge subsidence problems going on in here, and fishing, and it's all agricultural related groundwater over extraction. And so this is a difficult policy program for the county because they actually don't have very much regulatory authority over the water agencies. And so as a consequence, this is just an, an informational map, and maybe someday there's something that can be done about it. So flooding, though, that was Riverside County's number one disaster um, issue that was coming into this project. And so we, we spent some time looking at that. And there's lots of flooding data out there. FEMA has maps, and the USGS has maps, and the County Flood Control District has maps, and they don't always agree. There's very little data for the whole eastern half of the county, but since only eight people live there, it's not such a big deal. Um, no data for a lot of the government lands or tribal lands. And these data sets were very inaccurate based on um, all the modern construction has just completely changed the topography, of course. And so if you have a parking lot and it rains on the parking lot instead of what used to be a grassy field, 
that water instantly shoots off the asphalt and into a channel, and so your cues go up dramatically and very, very quickly. And then, of course, this also enhanced some of the DEM inaccuracies we had. So a lot of work went into massaging these data <coughs> to make sense. Ultimately, 100-year flood is sort of the standard that you know, regulatory by, but we wanted to go to a 500-year flood um, with respect to, I think South Carolina is now looking at the 1,000-year flood, right? So these are uh, indeed thresholds by de design. So the point is, is that once you, loot, once you have an event like this, don't replicate the event into the future by redoing your same land use plan and just rebuilding it simply. So get the railroad out of the floodplain, for example, and all the hazardous waste facilities that come along with it. Review these design thresholds regularly because as new development occurs upstream or even downstream, it affects these flood models dramatically. And look long term. If you're trying to build a, a county that incorporates open space for, for recreation, open space for um, habitat, a lot of these kind of places make great sense for that. And then require that high risk facilities rehearse evacuation plans. We're talking about, you know, the, the post uh, New Orleans, I mean, get the old people out of the, the, uh, the people who can't move, the, the hospitals have generators, different things like that. Learn how to predict the future disasters and, and get a plan for those. And then phase out these existing land uses which are not compatible with the floodplain. One of the early requirements in the safety element, it's almost gone away, but it's still there, is dam failures. And California is very famous for dam failures. I mean, we started with the uh, Mulholland's dam up in, down in Santa Clarita, the St. Francis Dam, and that failed in 1928. Um, it killed 500 to 1,000 people. Um, Baldwin Hills Reservoir, 1963, built in an oil field, active subsidence, fractured it. It almost killed tens of thousands of people, but it was noted and they evacuated 100,000 people downstream through Culver City and Santa Monica and West LA. Otherwise, it, it would have been a complete disaster. And then, of course, the, the, the San Fernando earthquake the San Fernando Reservoir came within a meter of failure. It had an internal rotational landslide of the, of the, of the dam. And if they hadn't actually had water, the water been drawn down before the earthquake, just for, accident, just for maintenance purposes, that thing would have failed and it would have taken out a large swath of the San Fernando Valley. So three dam failures, one of them very catastrophic with a lot of loss of life. So there's a lot of sensitivity. It led to the formation of the Division of Safety of Dams. And so all communities have to build into their plan what would happen if such and such a dam were to fail so that you can fly around in the helicopters and warn the right people, things like that. Very important document. And this is the, the quality, however, that you get to work with. That's about exactly how it looks, too. It's just a little sheet of really bad paper. And so how would you actually know where the flood was coming through here? So we digitized all those, we enhanced them up, and I'm gonna show you this because it's just as crappy as the data we have to start with. But there's 41 dams that affect the county, and the biggest one is worrying about Boulder, or uh, Hoover Dam up here because it'll take out Blight. I'm not sure anyone but Blightians care, but it is still just a big deal to know what's going on. In fact, it just failed, didn't it, in the movie? San Andreas. So, anyway. So, Basically, this is aware, situational awareness for county emergency response people should a, a dam experience issues. And then their second biggest problem was wildfires, and this is the wildfire hazard map. And there's a lot of geology that goes into wildfire modeling because it needs stuff to burn and certain things grow on certain geological units differently and better than they do on others. So there are, flood, there are fire models that, that actually are pretty cool to run. So we didn't do much with that. However, so point is now work with the county, work with all of these factors, and build an educational program, build a land use plan that recognizes that we live in a very dangerous place, and gradually work to phase out the stuff that is least compatible with the with the geologic environment it's built on, 
and improve and adjust these data sets every time a new study comes in. Don't let them get static. It would have been almost 30 years since the county had done this before. Scale your studies to reflect the hazard, the risk to the project, and the vulnerability. So that's where you get into vulnerability now. So now that you have all these hazards, you can put the community on top of it. So all the stuff that we take for granted that is around us, our homes, our buildings, our freeways, our pipelines, all of these things are sitting on this geologic hazard environment now, and you can start to do some sensitivity modeling. And this is just like, take two seconds to do this. So like, here's where all the schools are in Riverside County. So they're all lined up along the San, the San Ana Fault, I mean the San Andreas Fault, and along the San Jacinto Fault, and in the Elsinore Fault. And up here's the Cucamonga Fault. So they did pretty well. Maybe that's not a great place to put schools, I don't know, just something. But maybe you can also use that as a, as a reason to stimulate a school to run some emergency drills every so often. Here's where all the hospitals are. Same thing, all lined up along the San Andreas. Well, of course, that's you know, Palm Springs, so you've got to have a lot of hospitals out there. Um, lined up along the Elsinore, plenty of, you know. But here's where, the, here's where the emergency services facilities are. They're in the fairly, you know, if there's anything that's less hazardous than Southern California. Anyway, you can model these things. You can learn to where they are. You can look at what happens if we rupture the San Andreas Fault. What would be those consequences? And this is very easy stuff to do now with the software that has us. The great shakeout was used all of these kind of informations. Work on understanding your community's vulnerability. Because, you know, the, the San Andreas didn't just come in the movie. Um, and this is kind of just Riverside County, 7,000 destroyed buildings, <coughs> 40,000 people displaced, maybe 2,000 dead. This is based on 1990 census data, so the 2004 or 5 data would be, you could probably double all of these numbers, well they wouldn't double this number, but you'd double these numbers here because there's more people at risk. But these kind of things can be modeled, this is really simple stuff, and if you're an emergency planner, this is like crack you know, can really use this stuff. So, it all got compiled into a report about the size of, of a concrete block and about as heavy, and um, it was adopted in 2005, and it has never been updated at all. Not one single pixel has changed on any of those maps, which is very, very sad. FEMA recognizing how valuable these documents actually are and how underutilized they are, jumped on the bandwagon in 2000 with the Disaster Mitigation Act. It says, if you want to get federal emergency uh, disaster money, you need to have a mitigation planning handbook that, that goes through your community and does a better job than you're currently doing at dealing with your hazards. And, and it requires disaster mitigation plans. And therefore, to do that, and FEMA says, we will review them and determine if they qualify, um, if they're good enough. And if you don't have one in place that we have approved, you are not going to get disaster money. Well, that's politics, of course. Did that work? I don't know. But we won't get into that, because it's good thoughts. Um, and it requires a much more quantitative analysis of a community's risk and loss than what we did with just the geohazards maps. It's much more comprehensive. And that's really a good step because people understand quantitative things as opposed to the, well, it could happen, but this is, would be the consequences if it did. And it requires a lot more public input into the system, more education. But the whole bottom line fails if it doesn't start with accurate and detailed hazard maps. And that is the point that we as geologists need to just embrace. So Riverside County has one of these plans. It's in place. It's approved now. Um, it was um, a, a big effort. Involved a lot of people within the county. It uh, didn't involve me. Um, but it, it establishes that basis for doing all of this work within, within the county at this point. And it prioritizes mitigation projects, not just concepts. And, and it was approved by FEMA. And so here's that old chart that I put up 
about the hazard mitigation cycle, and here's how I would revise it now. That we start with the hazard still, the hazard identification, but now we get into vulnerability much quicker. We're getting quantitative about what would happen. Should this event occur, what will happen? What will be the consequences of that? What are our alternatives to mitigate that event in advance? And there's always alternatives. Then you get really downright quantitative with costs and losses and, and, and uh, uh, various other aspects to that. And then you prioritize your mitigation here. And then you figure out what you need, you get the political support for it, you get the public support for it, and it hopefully will slow down the pace of this cycle here because you're much more aware of all of the various aspects coming through it at this level here, much more quantitative. So I'm very hopeful that this is the right path and that we're on the right track with, with our, and this is a national program that FEMA has in place, but the national program definitely does not start with the same degree of accuracy of hazard maps as I know California cities have generally done. So these are all the hazards that they've included. Remember we had like eight, right? So they've gone through those eight, but now they've got things like highway, rail, and nuclear, and of course we've got terrorism and pandemic, and you know, we're definitely into the 20th, into the 20, 20 post 9-11 post era here. And then as they get into their matrix and how they're rating these hazards and their probabilities, you got some questions here if you're a geologist. So the earthquake is severity, but it's the same severity as terrorism or pandemic. So the earthquake is gonna take out, you know, 40,000 40, buildings. It's gonna take a serious effort by these guys to deal that, that out there. Landslides, a probability of only two. They have like 40,000 landslides in the county. I think they missed that number. But terrorism has a probability of four. Really? So, obviously there wasn't a good geologist in the room when that matrix was put together. But they did come up with a whole bunch of plans and they, they recognized that earthquakes, while they occur less frequently, they will account for the greatest combination of losses and, and uh, injuries in the county. Floods, fires, obviously this is their history, they're very aware of that. And then they still have other things that the, the earthquake is still their catastrophic disaster. So this you're not going to read, and that's not the point, but it's very specific. It's required that dependent care facilities have all flood vulnerable electrical circuitry flood proofed. Very simple. Maybe not simple to do, but very simple to say. You know, it's just very specific little documents. This is just for the flood hazard. And there's pages and pages of these. And then you go through and you prioritize these based on cost, based on bang for the buck, what you get out of it. And so the point is, though, as I've said again and again, and I'll say it again because that's what you're supposed to do, is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them again. And that is hazard maps are the basis for all of this. And do not tell anybody, don't let anybody tell you that they can't do, the, that they can do the job with just geologic maps off the shelf. You need to make them hazard maps, not just geologic maps. And you have to know those hazards so that you can assess your vulnerability. Risk is a quantitative measure, adding those two factors together. And then you can really get, get down to the, the calculations about what is vulnerable and what isn't, and what it costs to make this better. Because some failures also are simply unacceptable. Well, just to bump, we know, I mean, these things happen. I mean, I don't think South Carolina anticipated a thousand year flood. I don't even know what those statistics truly mean. But we know that floods happen, and we know that drains block up, and then suddenly you've got this. And we know that slopes fail. And at La Conchita, this was the second failure, and, and now 10 people are dead. Earthquakes are a fact of life in California, and we don't recognize that in advance. We are surely doomed to, uh, experience the movie over and over and over again. And fires are a big deal. We haven't had rain in 24 years, so um, this obviously is a problem. There's some things that are hard to predict, maybe even very hard to mitigate, but the thing is is that those things that we can predict, such as a rupture of a magnitude 8 earthquake on the San Andreas, we can model this 
beautifully, very quantitatively, and we can understand what its impacts are on our communities if we have good, solid data to use in that modeling. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you.